Lomography is an international communication project. It's communication with pictures. It brings people together. We like looking at very mundane things that are not that exciting in themselves, but that say something about the way we live our lives and the society and surroundings we live in. Lomography makes things big which are small and makes things small which are big. I love details, I love other people, I get this super positive feeling about little things. Lomography is an international photographic movement that breaks all the rules. It's about lifestyle and philosophy just as much as it's about taking good pictures. It's passionate, democratic and playful, and at its heart is a small wonder of Russian technology, the Lomo Compact. I've had this camera for... Oh, I don't know, but it's like four or five years now. Um... It changed everything for me as a photographer. It really opens your eyes, always having a camera on you, and it's like being much more in the moment, being aware. I started taking pictures all the time. I had, I had the camera on me always. Before that, you know, taking my camera out was a big deal and I would bring a bag and I'd have lenses and, you know, I really thought about what I was doing and with this I just stopped thinking and just started shooting everything. I got into buildings and, and streets and the pavement and pigeons. I have a whole series of pigeons. I went through a huge dog phase. I used to only like cats and then I started photographing dogs in the street and I really got into dogs, like meeting dogs and the different characters and little faces, these dog faces and you hold the camera right up to them and they come straight up and look and react. For me the whole thing is, is uh, it's just a way, of, a way of thinking or engaging in your life. And I think the Lomographic Society is, is about that too. Like really encouraging people to come together and to have fun with their life and with all the little details. And to take a lot of photos. <laughs> About 25 years ago, I went to the Boy Scouts and I met Matthias. We became very close friends and when all of us moved to Vienna for our studies, we moved together in a very nice, old, quite bohemian apartment in the third district of Vienna and had a really crazy students uh, community there. Many people always come in our apartment uh, visiting us. This was a kind of a typical student's apartment situation, like five people, everybody has a lot of friends, so it was a quite big community already. All the time new ideas came in and new people came in and uh, every night we had to discuss uh, philosophy, architecture, art. On the other hand, for sure we were drunk every night, we had a lot of fun, everything was about girls and parties. And in this atmosphere, Matthias brought the little Lomo camera. It was Matthias who started to take pictures with the Lomo because he found one in Prague and took it back to, to, to Vienna. The pictures that comes out of this camera are somehow more colorful. This is something which I cannot really explain. This is just because of this Russian lens. The lens also has this kind of tunnel effect. 
which means the corners are already a little bit black and the focus is going to the center of the picture. This is stuff I know today. When we started we didn't know that. We just saw those pictures have a special atmosphere. They have special colors. They are amazing. Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, it's very much in focus. So, wow, a Russian camera, a Russian piece of, of technology, smelling like Russia. And in the beginning we got two calls in one week of people who said can you help me find a Lomo? Later it was ten people every day who called us. Suddenly after a couple of months, maybe like 50, 100 people had the same camera in Vienna. And everybody was shooting with these cameras. So we should organize something. We should uh, do an exhibition with the pictures of all of these people because it's just a funny idea. All of them look with the same glass eye on the world, the Lomo lens. And then we said, okay, but before doing an exhibition, we have to found a society. This is very Viennese, this is very typical, and this is also quite funny. The first joke was the Lomographic Society by itself. Second joke was to do 10 golden rules. We always said we want to make parties, exhibitions, fairs and all the stuff, but we had no sponsors and we didn't even get money from the state. And so we always tried to finance those activities by selling cameras. Everybody who bought a camera, we said to people, you're not buying the camera, you're buying the membership of the Lomographic Society, lifelong membership, and this is your tool for the membership, so when you die you have to give it back. We found out the big problem is how to smuggle them out of Russia. This was the first reason why we were going to Russia, to have a look for cameras. There was a little Photoshop. We were always went in, asked, do you have Lomos? They said, no, we don't. But there were always some people standing outside of the shop. And we never know why they, why they knew what we want, but they knew it. And then we were coming out from the shop. They said, ah, you're interested in Lomo. Come on. And then we were going sometimes two hours by bus outside of Moscow. And on the 14th uh, floor of a building, we found in a, in a little room, but 700 Lomos. <laughs> For almost a century, the huge Lomo factory in St. Petersburg has been at the forefront of Soviet optics. At its peak, it employed 27,000 people. Lomo is unique with no less than three orders of Lenin, the country's highest honor, to testify to its proud history and numerous achievements. Lomo is a large во многих областях науки и техники. И если вот охарактеризовать целым, чем занимается ЛАМО, то это и фотоаппараты, и телескопы. Это и приборы ночного видения, это и в области военно-морского флота, это и в области ракетостроения. То есть 
во многих направлениях ЛАМО сегодня является одним из передовых оптических предприятий. История создания этой компании началась на рубеже 1913-1914 годов, когда в России чувствовалось приближение Первой мировой войны. И в это время для того, чтобы организовать производство оптики для российской армии... были тяжелыми. 12-часовой рабочий день, эксплуатация женщин и подростков. Поэтому начались недовольства, стачки, забастовки. И в феврале произошла революция февральская. А в октябре, 25 октября 1917 года, произошла социалистическая революция. Рабочие взяли власть в свои руки на заводе и стали управлять. Но недолго, потому что началась гражданская война. Рабочие ушли защищать завоевание революции. В заводе осталось всего 200 человек. Было холодно, не было хлеба, не было электричества. И приходилось выпускать продукцию только для того, чтобы прокормить себя ради хлеба. Но даже в это тяжелое время группа молодых инженеров создает первый советский киноаппарат. В 1937 году мы делаем первую в стране камеру для ручных съемок. Вот про бабушку вот такой камерой. На нашем заводе работало 8300 человек. Часть ушли в армию, часть ушли добровольцами. Часть завода была эвакуирована на Урал. 2000 человек остались работать здесь. Восьмого сентября сорок первого года началась блокада, а с двадцатого ноября сорок первого года уменьшилась норма выдачи хлеба до ста двадцати пяти грамм на человек. Это было страшное время. Кроме того, была очень суровая зима. Морозы опускались до сорока градусов. Доходили. И люди умирали прямо в цехах. Работали в основном мальчишки, девчонки, женщины. Кроме голода и холода, еще бомбежки, обстрелы. Всего на наш завод упало 1915 зажигательных бомб. Всего погибло от голода и холода 1499 человек. end of 93 some of us uh, got the idea hey now we are so cool we must do something in New York this would be the biggest thing uh, to bring our little demographic society to New York now and then I think I said New York is cool but it would be much cooler let's do Moscow and New York So it was 10,000 snapshots about New York in Moscow and it was 10,000 shots from Moscow in New York. And at that time the Americans didn't know anything about Russia. 
It was uh, four years after the Iron Curtain opened and for Americans it was even an offense to promote a Russian product. It was still this idea of the competition between the East and the West, the good and the bad country. В это время, в 1994 году, мы впервые узнали о том, что, оказывается, за пределами нашей страны существует целое общество в разных странах мира, которое очень любит нашу камеру Ломо Компакт. There we wrote an invitation to the Lomo PLC company in St. Petersburg, that we will invite you to our exhibition opening in Moscow, Moscow, New York. But the funny thing was that we wrote it on the 1st of April. And so they thought it's an April joke. Поскольку факс был датирован 1 апреля, а в России очень любят этот праздник, 1 апреля день дурака, то все посчитали, что это шутка. Что это шутка одного из бывших наших работников, который вот так вот нашел такой интересный розыгрыш и на него не обратили внимания. When we opened the exhibition in Moscow, all Russian TV stations were there and uh, even in the main news every hour they reported from our exhibition. And then this guy came at the opening and took the microphone and told the people I am the Lomo factory guy and told the story about the 1st of April. Then he invited us to come to, to St. Petersburg and to visit the factory. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, by the mid-90s the Russian economy was in crisis. The old Soviet ways were over and business had to adjust to the cold realities of capitalism. The Lomographers couldn't have picked a worse time. to adjust to the cold realities of capitalism. The Lomographers couldn't have picked a worse time. Когда в России начались, начались реформы и пошла перестройка с плановой экономики на рыночную, Лома увидела, что Дальнейшее производство и кино, и фототехники не позволит Ламос конкурировать с открывшимся рынком. So we went there, we had the meeting with Lazar Salmanov. Then he told us in the last 15 minutes before we, we, we left again, he told us, by the way, we will stop the production now of this camera because we think we cannot sell it anymore. This is old Soviet crap, so now people like um, other Japanese cameras. Раньше же мы выпускали до полутора миллионов фотоаппаратов в год, начиная от смены 8, любителя и вот ламо компакт. И вот в 90-х годах, когда на рынках России появились, на рынках Советского Союза появились уже фотоаппараты китайского производства, мы их так называем у нас в простонародье мыльницы пластмассовым объективом, которые стоили копейки, у нас получилось так, что мы вынуждены были сворачивать производство фотоаппаратов. И в том числе и ломо компакт, несмотря на то, что это был великолепный фотоаппарат. As news spread, groups began to spring up in other cities. First Berlin, then London. They would become the pioneers of an unusual art franchise system of so-called lomographic embassies. With ambassadors to sell cameras, mount exhibitions and help feed thousands of snaps to the Lomo World Archive. An ambitious proposal to document the entire surface of the planet. Lomo came into my life in 1994 after about two years of searching for Lomo I had finally found the address of the 
guys in Vienna, Matthias and Wolfgang, and um, I called them up and I wanted to order a camera for myself, which um, they answered by the question whether I had a fax machine or not, and whether therefore I would qualify as Lomographic Ambassador. Um, luckily I had a fax machine and um, they gave me the job, so that's how I got my first Lomo, really. One of the most exciting situations you can get into as a Lomographer is traveling, really. Because you enter a space that you don't know, where everything is new to you. If I'm traveling, I, I shoot four times as much film as I do when I'm in London. When I traveled to Japan recently, I um, decided to go to the fish market at four o'clock in the morning, which is definitely not my time. That's really in the middle of the night for me, but um, in order to get my special <laughs> Lomo moments, you know, from Tokyo, I wanted to go there. It's wholesale trading of tuna, so um, you walk into a big warehouse and you have 500 frozen tunas, um, you know, rolled up, lying there, ready to be auctioned. I spend about an hour with the auctioneers trying to understand their system and trying to get as many shots off as possible because this was the most exciting spot. But then I wandered off into the side streets of the market and met the people who had previously bought the tuna and now were chopping it into little pieces and selling it off to other fish sellers or selling it straight there as fresh sashimi or sushi. I spent two hours where I was just jumping around trying to capture every everything, the smell, the sound, the you know, the colors. It comes across this place much more than walking around and asking someone, can I take your portrait? I would never do that as a lomographer. I let them get on with their thing if they let me get on with my thing. <laughs> One of the pictures, for example, is of, an, of a fish seller. He didn't like me hanging around there. He didn't quite know what I was doing because I, was, I wasn't lifting the camera to my head, so I couldn't have been taking pictures. And I've got a picture of him looking at me, looking at my face in a kind of angry way. He doesn't realize that I'm taking a shot, but I like him for being angry with me almost, you know? <laughs> it makes it real, and it is a real, it is a real interaction. If I would have sta stood in front of him like this, there would have been nothing. Lomo had already decided to shut down camera production, but the Lomographers had other ideas. And then they appeared with us, and we started a conversation. They said that we started such a society of Lomography, they showed us what it was, they showed us their plaques, already made. Очень интересно, на самом деле, мне очень понравилось. И сказали, мы хотим бы у вас быть эксклюзивными покупателями, хотим, чтобы это был нашим товаром, и мы бы его распространяли по всему миру как элемент ломографии. Я говорю, хорошо, это устраивает, на самом деле, и ломой у вас. In uh, the mid of 95, we started getting 1,000 cameras every month, and uh, we really were able to get rid of them and to sell them. Фотоаппарат был нам не выгоден, не коммерческая получалась сделка, потому что они могли заплатить определенную цену за этот фотоаппарат, а вот себестоимость его была гораздо больше. And they were somehow starting to calculate really the cost of a camera, and finally they found out that the cost is much higher than they thought before. Before it was Soviet times, so it was there was no relation between costs and price. Price was political. Costs were just fact. So they decided to stop it. We got a fax to Vienna and they said, okay, no more cameras. It uh, w w was a real big problem for us.
reaching the open space, having trespassed the limits of our native planet, is the greatest achievement of mankind. It was made possible by the immense work of astronomers. The history of astronomic development is the history of perfection of astronomic equipment. And LAMO, which is one of the oldest enterprises in St. Petersburg, has played its major role in this process. When we visited the first time Lomo factory, they were showing us the range of products and the biggest product was a telescope in the Caucasus, which is the biggest telescope in the world, it used to be in the Soviet times. And this was also the biggest achievement of this factory. So immediately I was dreaming, I have to go there once in my life. Серьезных примеров и больших побед Ламо является создание в 1976 году на то время самого крупного в мире телескопа с диаметром головного зеркала 6 метров. Это был революционный шаг в развитии астрономических. We have this incredible telescope, like a, a big aluminium dome, like 40 meters high, and super architecture from the 70s. The telescope was conceived in the early 60s at the height of the Cold War and the race for space. Of staggering technical complexity, this was to be a masterpiece of engineering. It also had to be bigger and better than anything the Americans had. After almost 15 years work, it was installed high in the Caucasus Mountains. To this day, its six meter monolithic mirror has never been surpassed. This was a wonderful trip, wonderful experience. You know, I know the, the three guys from the very beginning and I, I liked them personally, I liked their enthusiasm and their uh, engagement in that story. Um, and uh, in a way they were also kind of young entrepreneurs taking a risk. И мы постепенно заходили в тупик. Хотя очень было обидно. Они попробовали сначала один ресурс политический привезли ко мне посла Австрии. Мы с ним поговорили, наверное, другу понравились, но ситуация продолжалась достаточно так же тяжело. So we went there, ties, um, suits, and uh, with the official representative of the Austrian state in St. Petersburg, the ambassador, and some delegates from Vienna. Очень толковые ребята, кстати. Они взяли, значит, несколько депутатов из австрийского парламента, Еще кого-то, еще кого-то. Ну, в общем, такие, так и собрали солидную делегацию, приехали в Петербург, но уже пошли не ко мне, а пошли к Владимиру Владимировичу Путину. When we went there, they said to us, oh, we are very sorry, but we will meet with the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. He's also responsible for all the commercial, um, economical um, issues. So, Mr. Vladimir Putin was the guy. И вот звонит мне на столе рабочим моим телефоном, мне говорят, что сейчас с вами будет говорить первый вице-губернатор Владимирович Путин. Я говорю, хорошо. Он мне говорит, Илья Ильич, я говорю, здравствуйте, Владимир, здравствуйте. 
что там у вас за проблемы с ломографами. Я говорю, ну проблема чисто экономическая на самом деле. Но вот они просят, чтобы я провел встречу у себя в кабинете, видимо, чтобы использовать это как последний аргумент. Я говорю, Владимир Ильич, я готов, нет проблем. They still think very much uh, in delegations, which may be worse, not only political, but also an aesthetic expression of communist time. You couldn't be alone, but you were not important being alone. You need a delegation. So we were a serious delegation, and Mr. Klebanov and the people from the Loma factory uh, arranged a serious delegation to welcome us. And so we were sitting on a very long table with like 25 people uh, to negotiate about uh, I think in terms of this uh, huge factory about a very unimportant contract. I think we spoke about one hour and Putin let's translate all the things we were said in, in, from German to Russia. Uh, but I think after half a year after we, we heard that he's able to speak German. Mr. Putin was very interested in the camera and I think he really got the point. He understood what that camera meant for the Lomo factory and even for St. Petersburg. So we declared him to be a Lomographer. He got a camera and I don't know, maybe he doesn't know anymore that he's a Lomographer. Mr. Putin, after the meeting, when he met Mr. Klebanov at a, at a Congress, went to him and said, hey Klebanov, what's going on now with Lomographic Society? I like this idea so much. And, and, and I think it's cool for your, for your factory, it's good for the city of St. Petersburg, so you, you should do the business with them. Uh, in общем, можно считать, что в некотором смысле Владимир Владимирович может стать крестным отцом мамографии, потому что, в общем, мы в его кабинете умялись, умялись. В общем, они uh, в итоге признали, что, да, дешевле, чем она стоит производство продавать нельзя. А я честно сказал, что мы на этой камере не хотим зарабатывать. Сегодня не хотим. Мы, конечно, будем работать дальше над снижением затрат, и там будем искать свою прибыль. И мы договорились. И вот с этого момента как бы, как бы из кабинета Владимира Владимировича пошла ломография. People say, oh, you take pictures, what do you photograph? And I just say, whatever I see, what I like, what I encounter in my life, what I cross paths with. I went through a really kind of self-portrait phase, constantly taking pictures of myself, you know, at arm's length. I try to capture myself being angry or looking terrible or looking beautiful or like all the different ways that one person can look at. Some of them really, really work. And you can get a lot of terrible pictures from it too. And then sometimes they'll just all be great and it's amazing. And, and, and magical ones, ones that don't make any sense. I do this thing sometimes where I have a flash. I'm in a low, low lit situation and I, and I press the button and the lens opens for a long period of time and then I just fill it with the flash. And it was Christmas. And I, I went round and round on the Christmas tree and all the lights and then back at myself with the flash at the last moment and I was wearing one of those paper Christmas crowns. And the picture came out and I'm like, ah! and there were like fireworks. And it's like I'm looking at them. And there's a lot of magic with, with the camera that way. We did a project for a band called The Gotan Project, which is a tango band uh, from Argentina. They live in Paris. We actually approached them and said, we would like to do your video. It was a fairly small budget, so we wouldn't earn a lot of money or any money on it. Um, but we decided that we wanted to do that job in a kind of normal way. I don't think we could have made that video in the way we did without being the Mogfers. There was a sort of mission aspect to doing it, which is that we just wanted to have visuals that we felt would go with the music. 
we walked around Paris trying to find a location that would allow us to well, create a kind of tango atmosphere. On the day when we started shooting, we still didn't really know what we were doing. We just wanted to create beautiful imagery, which we then did by using a kind of Lomo eye or a Lomo way of shooting things. And from a friend we had heard that at the Seine every evening in the summer tango dancers would meet and dance the tango. So we thought, what a beautiful uh, coincidence. So we went there and um, found the remaining half of our cast. One was a 92-year-old man who had shown up with his wife. She was 85. They were in perfect tango gear and that was a lucky coincidence coming in. Fabian and myself sat down and wrote a kind of script which was, I'd say the basic tenet of it was that we were going to sample tango in the same way that the music was sampled. We wanted to explore ways of how to use these still images and well get them moving really and uh, this camera takes 16 pictures in succession over about three seconds um, seemed to be kind of ideal to to animate <laughs> But then later we scanned all the images in and reanimated them on the computer which created a kind of 1920s wonky looking image <laughs> which was a, a beautiful little effect. Tango is a conversation between two people in the same way that Lomo is a conversation between you and the world. Tango is a rigid set of steps that you learn and there are definite ways to do tango but good tango, sexy tango, great tango is about taking those steps and then improvising. We were kind of dancing with them, them because there are certain steps to taking good pictures or good film images and then on top of that there's an area where you don't know what's going to happen where it is improvisation and that's the exciting area because you can't plan it. Most of the new cameras that are actually produced and designed by the Lomographic Society take multiple shots. But they're all trying to break away from using a camera in a traditional way creating an image that looks new and that looks unique. This is the plastic camera program which belongs to the family, which belongs to the philosophy, but is not has a different aspect. The action sampler has four lenses which starts uh, to open the lenses in one circle. So we have a little time between the first and the last of the, of the photos you take and so you have always a little movement but it depends if you move the camera or if your object moves. I remember we had a good success with the action sampler in New York City where we launched it first. Live from New York. Action sampler dynamizing. It was the best thing which could happen to us. All those little cameras with movements are from the content, uh, very lomographic. So there's, a, so there's a, a, a connection between the cameras, what they do, and, and our ideas. Exemplar camera. There is the action sampler camera, which was the first one. These are four lenses and a square. But the super sampler camera was the, let's say, first camera we developed by ourselves. The super sampler has four lenses in one line and takes four pictures in a series. When you push once the button, you get like four pictures on one print, a little sequence. This camera is developed 
by ourselves, engineered and now produced in China. Chinese production is coming from a tradition of cheap plastic products. Smart, quick, easy to build, nice solutions, maybe not so in detail, but functional, strong, very efficient um, production. China is opening up very quick now. It's economically really exploding in a way, and they can produce everything and they do it very, very quick. Chinese people are so much looking for new opportunities and even to understand how other cultures are thinking. So they try everything and even they try to understand what is lomography, what is behind this philosophy and this idea. And I'm not so sure if they really understand what we are doing, but it's a very, very interesting intercultural experience. Since the beginning of Lomography, 150,000 Lomo compacts have been sold. The biggest influx of new members has come through sales of the cheaper plastic cameras. In barely three years, over one and a half million have been snapped up. We have now Lomo embassies in Japan, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, very strong in Seoul, Korea in Kuala Lumpur, in Bangkok, so Asia is the strongest part of the world for homography. Lomo is capturing some young hearts. It's so accessible, it's so convenient, it's so cool, it's so different, it's so alternative, it's so lo-fi and yet, you know, so visually colorful. After becoming homographers, you just open your eyes a lot more. We can see a lot of details, a lot of patterns, a lot of colors, a lot of textures. Lomo is a kind of, mm, for me it's different, because it's not just a camera. It's, uh, behind it is a culture. The job of an ambassador in Hong Kong is to uh, keep a community going. So my job is to provide a linkage so they, they, can, they know where to exchange photos. And we have um, magazines in Hong Kong that would publish their work. And we are free to do anything we want. So I have to contact other lomographers, hey, you know, how have you been? Any interesting photos for us? Lomographers have a project called A Day in Life. Basically, it's us lomographers to document a day in their life. So, from, you, from getting up to going to work to coming back and having dinner and all those things. And, um, and I, I told them I would do one myself. So, I thought to look very carefully, you know, maybe also because it's a short walk from my home to my work. So, I start to pay attention to every single detail on the way and, you know, snapping away. It's these small things, but you, you learn to appreciate beauty. 
right across our office, we have a production house. They produce events and uh, it's run by a drag queen. So we always have very fascinating uh, window display. So it would be like carnival style or sometimes a little bit of s &M. But accidentally, from the reflection, you can see our office. It looks like a double exposure. And I haven't really gone to try double exposure yet, but that one looks like a cool double exposure. The drag queen's shop, but you can see our office in it. Going to Hong Kong, that's a, always a great experience and to meet all the lomographers and we have always a strong program and go out a lot. Most of them are creative students, which is also typical for Hong Kong, I think. Yeah, I know it. Oh. Yeah. When you meet them, they're very open, they're very direct to, to the point. They show you all the time their pictures, they shoot all the time. And they have also some traditional links, I think, to their own culture because Chinese culture is very colorful. Yeah. <laughs> Superstar. Hello. Are we coming in? I noticed that the people who were the most active are usually the one who has a lot of interest. Like they, they do a lot of things outside of their work job and Lomo is being one of them. So they're by nature very curious people. The antennas are always out. They're always out there doing different things and experiencing new things. And I think Lomo is a convenient tool for them to document it. And I don't know what drives it, but they seem to be really, really into sharing, which is very refreshing. <laughs> This is the Hall, his Hall Kitty fan. With black light inside and yup. Oh, that's the inside. This, that's the inside of the van. This is nice. Yeah. Where is it? I, I love this very, very much. This is in the karaoke, and this is 
one of my uh, friend in radio station, and he is become artist now. He get a song in karaoke already. Yeah. So I sing his song also. In Hong Kong, people love karaoke, so karaoke is just a small room and it had a television and microphone and then people, they look at the uh, subtitle in the television and then sing like this. This is our life. If you have a Lomo camera, you take photo, then you have a pass. You have a passport to communicate with other country Lomographer. My work is uh, capturing the memories. So I take photo, take video to try to remember it. I have a website. The name is panism.com, P-A-N-I-S-M.com. I try to communicate with a lot of people, even they are on the other side of the earth. I wish to talk because my language is not really good, but I can use the photograph or the lumograph to communicate with all the people. I was the Tupolev. That's a good, good news <laughs> for everybody. Real Russian welcome. By the way, Steffi is our St. Petersburg ambassador. Today, there are embassies in 70 cities and an estimated half a million active members of the society worldwide. For them, St. Petersburg remains their spiritual home and the Lomo factory their mecca. For all the twists and turns of the Lomo story, the little camera continues to deliver some unexpected and magical results.
we went to St. Petersburg in June 2000. They told us, do you know that Mr. Klebanov, our former boss, the general manager, you know so well and you did all the contracts with, he's now vice prime minister of Russia and he's responsible for economics, for space, for military, for industry, for technology and so on. So he's the, the second powerful uh, man in the government. У меня, я вот до сегодняшнего дня как бы работал всего в трех местах. Я работал на ЛАМО, я работал в администрации Санкт-Петербурга недолгое время и в правительстве России. В общем, работал только на ЛАМО. Я пришел туда молодым инженером и уже уходил оттуда генеральным директором. Ну, в общем, это вся моя жизнь на самом деле. Вся моя жизнь и личное, и, и в работе, и в бизнесе. На самом деле это, в общем... In an interview, I think in the Moscow Times, Klebanov said, when they asked him, how did you uh, make the acquaintance of Putin? He said, that was because of a meeting we had in the city hall with these crazy Austrian photographers who presented uh, their ideas to the vice mayor, and I joined them because we had a meeting before, so I met the first time Mr. Putin. Я знаю, что она сейчас достаточно успешно развивается. Это здорово на самом деле, потому что трудно было себе представить. Но фотография, профессиональная фотография, это вообще высокое искусство на самом деле. Но это делается специальной, дорогой, уникальной техникой. И трудно было себе представить, что можно из такого простого, в общем, фотоаппарата недорогого сделать как как из художника. Потому что каждый желающий может стать творцом, на самом деле. Russian workers may still be a little bemused by the antics of their strange visitors from the West, but in Lomo they have found a common cause and a simple communication tool that bridges all language barriers. After all, with Lomo, having fun is everything. Здесь бывают молодые рабочие, которые поступают на фирму, я им рассказываю про историю нашего предприятия. Потому что, ну, во-первых, это интересно, во-вторых, я пришел сюда сразу после армии, совсем молодым человеком, и я люблю свой завод, я люблю ламо, поэтому мне хочется, чтобы все его любили, потому что... Потому что это самый лучший завод э, во всем городе. А Ленинград самый лучший город в мире.